Bilingual Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today we're going to be talking about kids these days and how they're not ruining a language. But first, we have an exciting announcement. Lingthusiasm is on Patreon. Yay! Yay! So if you want more Lingthusiasm every month, or an opportunity to ask us your burning linguistics questions, or you just want to help us keep the show running sustainably, doing things like paying our producer and our web hosting fees and the person who writes our transcripts, then you can help support us on the Patreon, and that directly allows us to keep the show running in a sustainable manner. Yeah, and if you're wondering if we can upgrade our mics, or have guest linguists to interview, or maybe even a live show? Live show! Yes, we want this to happen too, people. We really want this to happen. We want to hang out. We want to hang out with you guys. Um, the answer is yes. We would like to do all these things, but we can't do it alone. The cool thing about Patreon is that it allows us to keep this space advertising free for everybody. So the main episode every month will always run without advertising. So every time you don't hear an ad trying to sell you a web building tool or something <laughs> to eat uh, or something to read, uh, then... You or I think I think we should really take ads for, like, sketchy teach yourself a language in three days courses. I think those would be really reputable to associate ourselves with. Definitely. Um, we don't have to do that, though, because we've set up the Patreon, and we think it's a much better way for us to keep doing the show and for you to keep enjoying the show. And if you want to listen to our bonus episode, the first one is about swearing. So we decided not to swear in the main podcast because we want people to be able to put it on at work or around kids. So instead, we're really letting loose in the Patreon episode. <laughs> so if you pledge, you can listen to that right now. You can listen to us talking about our swear acquisition histories and mm. uh, words that sound like swear words in other languages. Mm -hmm. Among other things. So we had a lot of fun recording that episode. I put it on to check that the levels were okay and I ended up listening to the whole thing, <laughs> even though... Half of it was my voice. Were you like, wow, that's a really good point, Gretchen? Yeah, I was like, you make such good arguments. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, I feel so connected. Our second bonus episode is going to be about how to self-study linguistics, uh, which has been chosen by our Patreon supporters, and we are really excited to have that up later in the month because we already have Patreon supporters. We only mentioned the Patreon on social media. There's already been a bunch of people uh, who have pledged for us. So thank you for that if you're already one of those people. And if you're just hearing about it now, it's a thing. Maybe you'd like to do that. At patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or you can follow the links from lingthusiasm or basically anywhere else. We've tweeted and Facebooked about it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> really obnoxiously. Uh, and also, if you can't pledge, we have totally been there. We know what that's like. And we are keeping the main episodes free. And it's also super helpful. You can rate us on iTunes and recommend the show in general. We've been doubling in listeners every month. So that's really cool. It really is mind blowing. And it's so great that other people are enjoying the show. We're so pleased that you are on board with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for getting your friends to listen. Thank you for rating us on iTunes. Um, <laughs> it's apparently a thing you have to do as a podcast is be really into getting people rating you on iTunes. But we're just really glad that you're listening. Actually, I want to correct the doubling of listeners part. We actually increased infinitely the first month because we had zero listeners. <laughs> Good science, and Gretchen. Good science. So just so no one writes in to correct my math. We've already got to the punchline of today's episode, but we want to make sure that you leave knowing full well that kids are not ruining language. It's okay, everyone. The kids are okay. The kids are okay. The English language is okay. The other languages are more or less okay, but if they aren't, it's not the fault of the kids. So one of the ways to put the you know, complaining about kids' language these days into some context is to look historically at the types of things that people used to complain about kids doing and whether those came to pass and if so whether everything was ruined. Spoiler, the answer is no. Because complaining about the youth goes back a long way. Like it goes past the current generation of people who are complaining about the youth and goes back basically to the beginning of written records in Western history. 
I imagine that people were complaining about the youth before written history, we just don't know about it. Yeah. And so one of the most early objectors that we have record of complaining about what the youth are up to these days is Socrates, who complained that all of this newfangled technology called writing was making people forgetful and lazy in terms of learning things because they no longer had to commit them to memory, they could just read them. Those kids, they don't recite Homer like they used to. (laughs) It kind of reminds me of like the anxiety around modern technology when, you know, parents are really concerned that children aren't learning to maybe read properly because they're reading on screens instead of paper. I mean, now that we have the Google, who even remembers anything? Mm, Exactly. We always blame the technology. But yeah, Socrates was saying the same thing about writing it it at all. Which I kind of like because all of these people who worry about the use of today that they're not respecting writing the way they used to. It's like, well, back in the day, no one even respected writing so yeah um, you're not being pedantic enough really and even post socrates there's a long period of not very many people being literate yeah exactly so this idea that everybody writes is quite new and really specific to a minority of the world's languages today they are the minority that have the most speakers but many of the world's seven thousand languages get along quite well as a purely oral and verbal mode without any written kind of standard. And I think that when we think of languages that are oral languages, we also don't think so much about how English also made a transition from being a purely oral language to being both written and oral. So that's something that happened in the Middle Ages gradually with fits and starts. And there's not as much preserved from the English oral tradition as there might be. I mean, there's Beowulf, but there's there's stuff we've lost there too. It would just be so great to have an audio video documentary of old English. Someone needs to invent time travel. This is what I would do if I had time travel, is I would go back to all of these different places and times and like document their languages, <laughs> obviously. That is the first thing we'd do. I mean, if you can go way back, you could see if you could find the like hypothetical proto-world, like the ancestor of all of the human languages. Like, was there just one? Were there several languages? Like, can we go back and find this? When was it? Time travel is really the only way that this is ever going to get solved. Yeah, so that's definitely not my highest priority. And then you could go back and find, like, specific proto-languages, like proto-Indo-European and... (laughs) I love that this is, like, top of your to-do list. I have thought this through. I have thought (laughs) of this before. (laughs) I love the, like, the first grant request after they've invented time travel is you being, like, gonna take my audio recorder let's go (laughs) yeah so we can't go back that far to see what people were complaining about the kids doing but we can still go back pretty far in written records and you have some historical records right yeah so in addition to socrates there's a bunch of people complaining about latin errors that people were making in kind of medieval latin and being like these people they speak terrible latin they write terrible latin and a lot of those so-called errors became totally common and unremarkable conventions in the romance languages in french and spanish and italian and so on well yeah all of the romance languages are really quote unquote corrupted forms of latin but now we think of them as really fancy yeah my favorite example so i actually put a call out on twitter for this because i just had a feeling that somebody must have complained about this at some point when English and French were kind of mixing together after the Norman Conquest. And Dave Sayers, who's a linguist, came to the rescue and pointed out that this historian, Bokenham, in 1440 has this long complaint which is written in you can kind of understand it because it's like you know it's it's middle english at this point right but i will not try to read the middle english i'll read a part of the translation which says and this corruption of englishmen in their mother tongue begun as i have said in the everyday admixture of first danish then norman was greatly uh augmented and increased after the arrival of william the conqueror by two things and so on and so forth. Um, And then uh, skipping to a later part in the paragraph, and seeing this, the rural people saw that they might seem to be the more esteemed and honorable and the more easily open to the acquaintance of the worthy and the great, (laughs) abandoned their mother tongue and labored to be able to speak French. And thus, in the course of time, barraged them both and spoke neither good French nor good English. (laughs) Oh, I love it so much. So basically, the, like, English we have now that is maybe a third 
lexical items borrowed from French would just upset this guy a lot. This guy was really mad. And I mean, the ironic thing is, is of course, he uses some French words in his complaint. Oh, yeah, but they're the okay ones. <laughs> yeah. So he uses words like corruption and familiar and augmentation and honorable. And all of these words come from French in his complaint. That is so good. But he's still really annoyed by this. They barbarize them both and speak neither good French nor good English. Also known as modern English. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Yeah, that is so good. So peeving about how people are speaking today and how the generations of modern generations are ruining language is a thing that we have a, a long and studied history of. I mean, but it's just going to, like, in 500 years or in a thousand years, it's going to make you look like you didn't know what you were doing. So why not just skip that and, and not peep in the first place? So people have been complaining about the way people talk for a very long time. But what I also find quite fascinating is often the things that people complain about young people doing aren't necessarily just done by young people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the complaints about features of language that people find irritating are often found across their own generation as well. But for some reason, they kind of focus on young people doing it. Perception bias isn't a thing, right? Perception bias is like a massive thing here. And like is... A really great example of this because there are some uses of like that people find irritating but have been used for hundreds of years. Yeah, so there's a there's a linguist who is kind of the She's like the boss of like. She is like the person who knows things about like. And her name is Alexandra Darcy and she's a linguist at University of Victoria in, in BC. And she has done a whole bunch of stuff about like. She's looked at different people's uses of it, perceptions of it. She's just come out with a book called 800 Years of Like, which is about how like has an 800 year history. I haven't read the book yet. I assume it's good. <laughs> She's really great, and I love this. She's done quite a few interviews, and I've read some of her shorter stuff, so I, I feel confident in saying that the book would be good. Yes. Um, she's done a great interview with Lexicon Valley, so you can you can check that out if you like more podcast things. And she's she's talked about like and said one of the points that she's made in one of her papers is that it's not randomly inserted. So one of the things that people have as a perception is like it's like, oh, people are just throwing it around randomly and inserting it randomly. She says, no, you can actually characterize a bunch of different functions that it has and where each of those go with respect to other kinds of words. So there's the approximative like, which is the one where you say what are we having for dinner? Oh, I don't know, like pasta, which doesn't commit you to having specifically pasta, but something in that general domain. Yeah. Or there's quotative like, which is one of my favorites, which is when you say, and then I was like, and then she was like, to introduce reported speech. I find it so useful. It's so useful. The cool thing about quotative like is that you can use it to introduce something that's not a direct quote. Okay. So you can say something like, and I was like, and then you can make a facial expression. Yeah. Or you can use it to in introduce what you're thinking rather than what you're saying. Uh, so you can say something like, and I was like, I can't believe this, but I said, blah, blah, blah. Oh, really? How interesting. So you can use it to kind of manage the dichotomy around various different ways that you could react or that you could say in response to something. So it has a lot more subtlety than said. The evolution of like, and the fact that a lot of people use many of the uses, but young people continue to innovate interesting and stable uses of it shows that people are really clever at language and that it's a very creative thing to do. But there are these like red flags that just go up for people when certain things happen. And it is often only when young people do it. So an older person may use like in many similar ways, but it flies under the radar. Yeah, I think one of my favorite responses to the quote of like thing is an XKCD comic we'll link to. And it's a dialogue and it says, I found this article on the linguistics of quote of like, uh, like when you're like, she was like, and she's like, yeah. Features a quote from a linguist, Patricia Kokoravilla. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, eventually, all the people who hate this kind of thing are going to be dead, and the ones who use it are going to be in control. <laughs> and then the other character says, wow, turned linguists are pretty hardcore. Yeah. <laughs> I think she means dead from old age. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to start saying like more just in case. <laughs> Uh, so every linguist of my acquaintance posted about this being like, we are hardcore, we're totally hardcore, thanks for recognizing this XKCD. But I think this touches on an important thing that often gets lost, or has, has historically gotten lost in the rhetoric around linguists being descriptive. It's a chicken and egg thing. What we're saying is, this is what people do isn't an interesting phenomenon, and that's interpreted as 
linguists are saying this is a good thing to do, so do it. We're saying, no, it's, it's good because it's interesting to us. It's there. It's just, it's a reflection of what, of what exists. And us saying that it's actually interesting and complex and has its own rules doesn't mean that we're necessarily advocating that you have to do this. But I think we'd be putting our fingers in our ears and closing our eyes and going, nah, 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 nah I can't hear you, <laughs> to say, oh, this doesn't exist, so we can't analyze it because it doesn't fit with our idea of what English should sound like. And I think it's also important important to acknowledge that just because we notice it's a phenomenon doesn't mean that we don't still encourage people to use appropriate language in appropriate domains. So something like quotative like is, I think, completely acceptable. I use it all the time and I find it really useful, but I definitely wouldn't encourage a student to use it in an essay or in a formal email to a colleague at work. I think if I saw it in a novel, I would still be surprised. Yeah. You know, novels tend to use said still for, for dialogue tags. But I think that that's a, you know, language has multiple registers and multiple styles that are used in different environments, but that doesn't mean that one of them has to be wrong. You know, like we have different types of clothes that we wear for different situations. That doesn't mean that the only correct clothing <laughs> is like one kind. <laughs> Like, you must be wearing a three-piece suit, and if you're not wearing that, you might as well not even be wearing clothes at all, like... I don't know, I wear my tuxedo around the house all the time. And that's, you know, it's part of... I, I don't want to draw attention to our own language use because people have to listen to it, but I definitely don't speak like I talk to you on the podcast in the same way as I do in a job interview, and we're probably even more informal when we're not trying to be articulate for podcasting. Or like with children or with a pet or something like you talk differently. But I think it's also worth pointing out that what we think of as formal and correct and so on when it comes to language is also based a lot on the existing power dynamics that happen in our society. So the type of English that we think of as the best English, it's not like they did a survey of all the Englishes and they analyzed them for like their expressive capability and they were like, after a sober consideration of the merits, we've decided this one. No, it's often the and i think one thing we probably should have flagged earlier on in the conversation is we're talking mostly about age based differences even though they're somewhat arbitrary here but of course there are other socio linguistic factors that this interacts with and there's gender and there's a uh, level of education and there's race and there's different dynamics happening in the UK and the US yeah all of this interplays, and I think sociolinguists have always been really great, especially the kind of ones who look at variation in different groups have always been really great at acknowledging a lot of these factors. Yeah, but we come into this saying, well, the, the type of English that's been considered the best is the kind that's, you know, modelled on Latin, that's spoken by upper class British dudes from like the 1800s. Yeah. And... <laughs> That's a very particular type of English. It has no more particular merits than any other one, but they're, you know, people who wanted to be associated with that type of group have been... Perpetuating that standard. Exactly. Which is more or less accessible to different people, and we acknowledge that. And that's why it's, you know, it's important to teach, I think, the idea that there are genres and there are audiences and the variety of English that you might speak at home or to your friends is not necessarily less valid. It's just not the genre appropriate. Yeah, it's complicated because a lot of people get taught in school, okay, this is the right way to do things, or this is what you, you know, this is what you need to do. And on the one hand, you can say, okay, well, the school's trying to give you those to survive in the world where people are going to judge you based on your language. But they're also perpetuating the ideology that makes it okay to judge other people based on their language. Yeah. And I I used to be a bit of a peeva mm -hmm. about and can, like feel like I kind of knew these three things about language. But actually, because I'm rubbish at spelling and because I've often had not the kind of default best accent, quote unquote, as an Australian in other contexts... I kind of learnt really quick. <laughs> I learnt really quickly that they were like complaining about the way other people use language wasn't going to get me very far because I'm not always that standard at it myself. Yeah, I think. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff around the Canadian accent. Some people, you know, because it's not quite the same as the U.S. But Americans tend to have a very caricatured idea of what constitutes a Canadian mm -hmm. accent, and then having a Nova Scotian accent within that, I also have non-standard features. But I think, like, Canadian when I was accent. initially interested in language, it often gets conflated the idea that oh, you're interested in linguistics, so you must also be interested in, like, judging people's grammar. Yeah, I got a bunch of those books from people early on. And, you know, if I meet people at parties and they're like, oh, you're a linguist, I guess I better watch how I talk around you. And I'm like, no, 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 please don't. Well, I mean, I'm interested in what you're doing, but, like, I'm not... <laughs> 
you know, I like to analyze your vowels, but like, I don't want to criticize you for them. That's the thing I find interesting is these like complaints about language tend to center on the same things again and again. Whether or not people use like all over the place is one of them. People are really obsessed with literally. Mm -hmm. Literally obsessed. Hyperbolic literally. I mean, hyperbole is a thing. Hyperbole is a real thing that people do. I don't think anyone complains at saying like, if I've told you once, I've told you a million times, like suddenly no one understands what million means anymore. Yeah, you know, like, everyone's pretty chill about fabulous, meaning that something's pretty good these days. No one's like, I'm sorry, but it doesn't pertain to fables. Why are you using the word fabulous? I mean, to be honest, I actually don't think we're being pertantic enough about literally, because it literally means pertaining to a letter. Uh. And so if you're not using literal to mean pertaining to the alphabet, I think you're using it wrong. If you are not struck down <laughs> by absolute pure awe, the thing is not awesome. Yeah, true, true. But it's also awesome and awful mean the same thing. And like, if you use them to mean different things, you're, you know. Yeah. So once you start, it's it's like um leveling up, right? Like you start and you're like, ah, oh, language has rules. And here are a few I've learned and I'm going to be judging other people for not also knowing the secret club rules. And then you kind of learn that actually all language is somewhat arbitrary and changing all the time. And a lot of things that people take as like hardcore rules and don't like other people not doing were at their own time like arbitrary non-standard uses and then you feel a bit more relaxed about things. Yeah like etymology is really fun like I like learning where words come from and oh these three words actually have this hidden connection like that's really interesting. There's a nice graph by Rob Drummond that illustrates this which we can link to and it kind of shows that when you start learning things about language often your kind of knowledge about language and your pedantry increase in lockstep with each other and then at a certain point your knowledge about language levels off for a bit it's a stylized graph and your pedantry just massively increases and then as you keep learning more you realize there's actually no point in being pedantic about it and in fact your pedantry goes right way down and you start getting really annoyed by people who are who are annoyed about language and your knowledge about language keeps increasing and so trying to move as rapidly as possible into that final stage it's pretty zen over this side i have to say it's really zen it's really good for your blood pressure to not be a pedant yeah a lot of what we've been talking about as well has been presuming that it's older people complaining about what younger people do but ali severin at monash university did a really great thesis on looking at older and younger people who have feelings about non-standard grammar usage and things like spelling there there and there and some people move through this trajectory younger or older Mm -hmm. It's not exclusively an age thing. I mean, it's also gender. It's also race. It's also class. It's there's a bunch of different levels to it. It's also, you know, I have level of education. If you spend, you know, five or 10 years figuring out, okay, this is how you should use an apostrophe, then you can get very self-righteous about apostrophes when it comes to other people. And that's, it's been very good for my, you know, sense of relaxation and sense of calm to be like, actually, what I'm really interested in is just tracking the decline of whom and the bizarre circumstances under which people use it to try to sound fancy even when it isn't historically, uh, that's not historically the right environment. <laughs> it, it becomes an interesting question. You can say, like, let's look at this academically. One of the ones that I'm tracking is the combination of a lot with no space. Because historically, we've done this with the words like all right and albeit and altogether. And a lot's heading that way. It's heading that way for perfectly good historical reasons. It's not used like a lot. We've kind of touched on the fact that a lot of these changes that happen that people decry are often indicators of creativity and they can be predictors of actually good language skills. So Nina Kemp has been doing, I have a post from 2011 here, but she's been doing some work at the University of Tasmania over the years looking at the texting skills and literacy skills of young students and as a general predictor, just because a student is really using a lot of informal language in their text messages doesn't mean that they're going to be using that in classrooms as well. If they're educated in using the right language for the right audience, it can generally show good literacy skills and they're, they're capable of using one type of language with their friends and another in testing situations. So just because people do use non-standard forms in some contexts doesn't mean that they're actually bad at language. Uh, I'm going to invoke XKCD again. I can't believe I got to cite XKCD twice in the same episode. But there's another XKCD comic, which we'll also link to. You know, another study found that kids who use SMS abbreviations actually score higher on grammar and spelling tests. And the other character says, well, why on earth is that a surprise? 
Imagine kids suddenly start playing catch literally all the time. Everywhere they go, they throw balls back and forth, toss them in the air, hurl them at trees and signs nearly every waking hour of their lives. Do you think their generation will suck at baseball because they learn sloppy skills? <laughs> It's true. It keeps you playing around with language more and thinking about it more often. And I think that being reflexive about your own language use is something that can happen also happen in informal settings. If you think about sending a text to someone that you have a crush on or that you need to break up with, um, these are very high stakes social interactions that you might get three friends to read over your text with you and say, do you, do you think this strike the right note? <laughs> like, is this what I should be saying? Did I use the wrong? Should there, should there be a full stop there? Yeah. Someone tagged me on Twitter in a thread about uh, she's sitting on a train and she wa was watching a, a middle-aged woman composing a entirely emoji text that had various combinations of happy emoji, you know, like the party one and the smiling face and the heart and so on. And she composed and composed and deleted this text several times with different combinations of emoji because she was trying to strike the right aesthetic balance. And I think that if, if you think of good writing as writing that is self-reflexive and accomplishes its goals, I think that people are doing a lot of that when it comes to texting or other types of internet media communication. And often it can be hard to figure out the generation that is using the non-standard forms and why they're using them. So I have a really nice example from my family uh, where I have text messages from my mid-twenties sister and my late-eighties grandfather. And my grandfather's the one using all the short forms and, you know, half-finished sentences and really kind of flexible, slangy language because he learnt to do television telegrams in the war, so he's used to really shortened forms, and smashing those really awkward uh, non-smartphone keys is really hard for him, whereas my sister uses a swipe keyboard, so it's easier for her to use standard language in that context. So you get the inverse of what people generally presume happens across generations. Mm -hmm. And even kids saying, well, I heard this from David Crystal, who'd been talking to some high school kids, and they said, well, we don't use, you know, these texisms anymore, because that's what our parents do, and that's not cool. <laughs> Nobody wants to be like their parents. Yeah, so it's driving standardized language in text messages. Another way that you can look at writing quality is in sheer number of words. <laughs> right. Because obviously, if you write the most words, that is the best. I, I'm, I'm kidding a little bit here, but there's a really interesting study that looked at, this is Andrea Lunsford and Karen Lunsford. They looked at a longitudinal study of student writing across the decades. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at papers from like American college students, like first year university students in 1917, 1930, 1986, and 2006. Cool, what a spread. Yeah, so it's almost 100 years of of different points in what students in like first year composition writing classes are doing. And they found a couple really interesting things. One is that they found that the essay writing, the, the number of words per essay has increased by 10 times. What? Yeah. So in 1917, the students wrote an average of 162 words per essay. That's not an essay. That's a paragraph. Oh, well, it was written by hand in like, you know, big fountain pens. So I guess it looks like an yeah, essay. Yeah, fair, fair enough. And in 1986, they wrote 422 words. Right. And in 2006, they wrote over a thousand words. Wow. And so then, you know, the number of words they've written is greatly increased. But what's interesting is that the number of errors yeah. stayed remarkably constant over a hundred years. Wow. So students in 2006 are making the same number of errors, but they made different errors. Okay, that kind of makes sense. So in the earlier studies, the biggest, biggest error was spelling errors. But in 2006, the students aren't making spelling errors anymore because their computer process Processing their papers yeah and they have spell check now and so now the biggest error became wrong word so now they're using spell check but they pick the wrong word another thing that's changed is what the writing instructors prioritize because how they decided whether something was an error is they had a bunch of university professors mark the papers mm -hmm. you know the, the professors decided what to consider an error and one of the big errors that showed up in 2006 was incomplete or missing documentation, meaning they did the citations wrong. But in 1917, they weren't even expecting students to write citations. So the kids are doing okay is basically the takeaway. The kids are doing okay. Once you kind of become aware of the fact that a lot of this change isn't as strongly generational as we think it is, and it often actually shows really positive things about younger people's language use... It seems like quite a bizarre thing to be so hung up on complaining about what the kids are doing these days. 
I think language is a thing you can project a lot of your other worries on. Right. So any worries you have about the kids, you can project on their language. Yeah. So I want to coin a term. Lauren, can I coin a term? Uh, okay, this is your one term that you can coin for this episode. Go. So I think there is a problem when it comes to people dismissing the ideas contained in an argument because it's coached in terms that are not prestigious linguistically. Right. So saying that, you know, you said something and you've used an apostrophe wrong in it, so I can dismiss what you've said because you used the apostrophe wrong without engaging with whether or not the argument itself was good. Right. Or conversely, oh, you, you made this argument and you said it in eloquent terms, so I should give it more, more credence. And I think this is a logical fallacy. And I think this is a logical fallacy that's kind of like an ad hominem attack where you say, oh, well, you're ugly, so your argument isn't good. I want to call it an ad vocum attack or an ad vocum attack attack, which is like you attack someone's voice instead of their argument. I feel like I'm more compelled by your argument because you've used this fancy Latinate term that you've made up. <laughs> I, I, I needed to take advantage of my misspent Latin education. The ad, I don't even know if it's vocum or vocum. This is what I love. It's like there's no right way to say it. It okay. could be vocum, it could be vocum, it could be vocum. <laughs> I don't know. There's like four right things. And if you criticize someone for the one they picked, you're doing it. So are you default required to always like vacillate and choose a different one each time just to keep people on their toes? Yeah. I've been thinking about this term because, you know, we were planning this episode and I was thinking, I think this should be a word for this. And I'm very inconsistent myself with how I say it. And I think that's great. I think that there's there's allowed to be multiple competing standards. If you want to engage in an argument in good faith, the way to do that is not to be persnickety about how someone's saying it and say, are these ideas, do they have merits? Yeah. You know, someone can be an eloquent orator and still have terrible, terrible ideas. If you name it as a logical fallacy and if you coach it in the terms of like, oh, it's Latin, it's fancy. <laughs> then maybe that's something we can borrow some prestige from Latin to say, nobody wants to do a logical fallacy. Like, this is a thing that, that we should recognize in ourselves. And if you are someone who likes calling people out on stuff, the fun part is by switching over to being more tolerant about language, you then get to call out all the people who are being persnickety about it instead of the people who are yeah. using apostrophes correctly. So you still have a group of people to get annoyed at, but you get to feel like you're contributing to a more positive cause. I think it also means that you can give people more useful feedback on language use. So instead of saying, don't use this form, you can say, in a formal essay, don't do this. You can still like use that in text messages. You can say things like the conventions of the genre are as follows. If you'd like to not follow the conventions of the genre, that's a decision you can make, but you should be aware that this is what the conventions are. Yeah. And another takeaway is if you look at what kids actually do when they're exposed to fragmented or incomplete linguistic input, they actually create full-fledged languages from kind of bizarre or difficult linguistic circumstances. A really famous example of that that we have is Nicaraguan sign language and the fact that we We've taken until episode seven to talk about it is actually pretty impressive because it's such <laughs> a great go-to anecdote for linguists and such an amazing thing that happened in the 70s and 80s in Nicaragua there was a change in policy that meant that a lot of deaf children suddenly came together at school instead of being isolated and using like their own home sign or maybe a little local village sign language and they came together and these children over the course of a couple of generations went from all having kind of only a rudimentary communicative system to developing what is now considered to be a fully fledged language which is Nicaraguan sign language and there are around 3,000 users of sign language now. It's got its own like language code. And the great thing is it's been studied since its birth, since the 1970s. There have been people watching the evolution of this language and how children can use limited resources and inputs to create something really sophisticated. Yeah, so it teaches us a lot about the human and the human child's capacity for language and like what you can do with that. So if ever we have disrupted or interrupted linguistic transmission, it's actually going to be the kids that save us. They're not going to bring us back to what we had before, but they're going to make a fully fledged linguistic system that's capable of complex ideas and complex thought. And this brings us back to a point from episode one, where we talked about the language of space and how... And our space babies! <laughs> Well, and how, you know, the American and the Russian astronauts and cosmonauts use each other's languages and use this hybrid English-Russian pigeon to communicate with each other. But because all the astronauts so far have been adults, this is kind of an incomplete, fragmented English-Russian hybrid. Space pigeon. However, if 
when we go to Mars, the astronauts and the cosmonauts got together and had some space babies. If there were children. Then these space babies would grow up exposed to space pigeon and they would turn it into space creel. And it would actually develop kind of more sophisticated grammatical structures. The children take the input that they get and turn it into a more fully fledged linguistic system. Yeah. So the kids in space are going to be okay. The kids in space are going to be okay. The kids on Earth are going to be okay. We're all okay. Someone needs to write this story about space babies. I would like to read it. (laughs) I would definitely love to read about babies in space standardizing (laughs) English-Russian pigeon into a creole. Write us about space babies. This is what I want to see. (laughs) For more Lingthusiasm and links to all of the things mentioned in this episode, you can go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. And you can support this podcast at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. I can be found at Gretchen A. C on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our producer is Claire, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!